me again, Gary Edwards, and this is week three. And today the focus on my talk is about how to write music, melodies, and the music theory part of the uh, story. Uh, it might get a little dry, but I'll try to break it up with a few humorous remarks. And we'll keep it fun if we can. I've been a little discouraging in the past about uh, the, your odds of success in writing music, so first I would like to talk about a couple of success stories. Now, for example, there's a Hollywood myth that every time Taylor Swift breaks up, she goes out and writes a song and sells a million copies, and that's added to her wealth. Another time, there was a lady named Susan Gibson who happened to be friends with a girl band before they were famous, and it turned out that these girls uh, formed a band called the Dixie Chicks, and Susan wrote her first song, which was called Wide Open Spaces, and I assume that she's made enough income from that to last her a lifetime. I was driving down the street one time and I saw a Rolls Royce driving down the street with license plates that said ASCAP. So at the next stoplight I pulled out my billfold and flashed my ASCAP membership card at him and he pulled over and we started a friendship and had coffee occasionally. But it turns out that this friend Tom had written the theme song to Grizzly Adams many years before and even though the show was no longer being broadcast, he was still getting thousands and thousands of dollars a year uh, and lifetime income because of residuals and because of uh, European and foreign markets. As for myself personally, I get enough motivation to keep me going. I've had two musicals performed. Uh, Eastern Washington University has performed five songs for my opera, Qual Chan. I've gotten 10 CDs that I produced in our own studio. I've written 10 original CDs and they've been successful on the internet and streaming. I've written 17 books and I've had 64 videos that I produced broadcast on CMTV in Spokane, Washington. And I could go on, but basically uh, there's enough incentive for me to keep composing. I've written the soundtracks for uh, How to Date Beautiful Women video on Amazon and also another movie that's being filmed right now called Mistaken Moves. The five semesters of music theory training that I've had in college have benefited me personally and I hope my little talk today will benefit you. What I'm telling you today is an overview, it's basic music theory. You can re-watch this video many times if you want to cement the information in your mind. Or you can maybe be motivated to sign up for a class at the local college or university on music theory. But I think it's important to know how to read and write music because then you're not so dependent on somebody else and you can produce the whole song by yourself. As I said earlier, there's uh, software that helps you learn music theory if you decide that you want to learn it on your own. Uh, Alfred puts out Alfred Essentials of Music Theory and also uh, ear training software. Ear training teaches you how to picture intervals in your head so that you can write your music easier. So for example, uh, if you remember the song, My Body Lies Over, well, the first interval in that song is a sixth going up. So, my ba. That helps you if you ever want to write a sixth going up. And the ear training software also teaches you the intervals uh, descending. There's another software program called Music Theory Learning, and you can Google that, and another popular software program in the schools called Practica Musica. Another useful uh, way to learn how to read and write music is by taking band, orchestra, or choir in school. They teach you the basics of music and how to count and the names of the notes and things that I'm going to go over today, but over a much longer period of time. For example, I took music from the 6th to the 12th grades in high school, and it was very helpful. And by playing in a band, you learn how to play in an ensemble so that you learn how to stick to the meter and stick to the rhythm count and how to synchronize with other musicians and make each other sound good. Join a church choir and uh, learn to sing and count and the essentials of key signatures and music theory in general. Let me talk about the basics of music theory. Millennia ago, our ancestors learned that maybe by beating a stick on a rock, you could create a pleasing sound and a rhythm that led to the uh, development of percussion instruments. Now sound is caused by airways vibrating at a certain frequency. For example, the A above middle C that is used for tuning an orchestra vibrates at 440 beats per second. And that's what creates that sound. 
if you want to play an A an octave above A equals 440, you can play it at 880 beats per second, and that'll give you a higher A, or you can play it at 220 beats per second to give you a lower A. Now there's three basic ways of creating music or sounds. One is by banging, as my example about the stick on the rock. Another example is by plucking, for example, a string or a guitar. Another example is by bowing. Another example of how to create sounds is by making a raspberry sound into a brass mouthpiece. By changing the pressure on your mouth, you can change the sounds to make them louder or higher or lower. Now, let's refer to our music theory rhythm chart. Notice that this is written on a five-line staff. So the names of the notes of the lines, starting with the bottom line, are E, G, B, D, F is the top line. So the way to remember that is every good boy does fine. Every good boy does fine. Now the names of the spaces going up, starting with the first space between the E and the G, is F-A-C-E. F-A-C-E, or face. So those are the names of the notes in the treble clef. Now rhythm-wise, the longest note in a measure of 4-4 four, four time is a whole note, which has four beats. So I'm going to play that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All of those notes have four beats. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now I'm going to play notes with quarter notes in them, and a quarter note means it gets one fourth of a whole note. So each note gets one beat. There's four beats per major, so it's played like this. I'll do a few measures. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now the next pattern is eighth notes. So an eighth note gets half of the amount of time as a quarter note, so it gets half a beat. And usually you count it like one and two and, so it would be like this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. A sixteenth note gets half of the value of an eighth note, so that means there's four sixteenth notes for each quarter note. So it would sound like one it is a two it is a three it is a four it is a one it is a two it is a three it is a four it is. I didn't have it on this example, but there's also triplets. So a triplet would be three notes per beat. One, two. A tie is used to tie two notes together. So on the first sample with quarter notes, the first two quarter notes are tied together. So it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then the other way to write that exact same pattern is with a half note on the first two beats and the third and fourth beats have the one quarter note. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now the next major has eighth notes with the first two notes tied together, then separate two eighth notes, then a two eighth notes tied together and two separate eighth notes. So this sounds like this. One, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and. Now a dotted note means that the dot adds half of the value of the note with uh, three eighth notes tied together in this example. Um, I'll play the pattern. And that's exactly the same note as a dotted quarter note 
followed by an eighth note as in the next pattern. Now in the major following there's three sixteenth notes followed by a single sixteenth note over the course of uh, four beats and it would be played like this one is a That's exactly the same as a dotted eighth note followed by a sixteenth note. Now notice that in the next measure the time si signature changes to three quarter time which means there's three beats per measure. Now here's a half note followed by a quarter note. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now here's three quarter notes separate in a three quarter measure. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now here's a measure with all eighth notes in the three beats. One and two and three and one and two and three. One and two and three and one and two and three. Of course you can mix up those times using ties or dots. Now here's a three quarter measure using sixteenth notes. One it is a two, it is a three, it is a one, it is a two, it is a three, it is a one, it is a two, it is a three. Next example uses a quarter note, two eighth notes, and a quarter note. So one, two, and three, two, two, and three, three, two, and three. All right, here's three eighth notes followed by an eighth note and a quarter note. Example using three sixteenth notes followed by one sixteenth note in three quarter time. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then with the uh, dotted eighth and sixteenth notes. next example is an example of syncopation where the beat comes off the beat, not on the beat. Da, 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 da. You hear the accent on the off beat? Da, 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 da. Ragtime uses a lot of syncopation and so does some forms of funky soul music. So these two measures are exactly the same. The eighth note with two eighth notes tied and an eighth note and then a two eighth notes tied. that music is divided into the measures. Another word for measures is bars. Many times a verse has eight measures and then changes. And then you have rests that are just the same as regular notes, only they're uh, written differently. So for instance, the whole note rest has it a half a line. Under the fourth line of the staff. A half note rests as the uh, line above the third line of the staff. A quarter note rest is a zigzag going down and an eighth note rest is a figure that looks like a seven. So it's basically a, a line with a flag on it. And that's an eighth note rest. In each measure, the values of all of the notes in that measure have to add up to equal the value of the time signature. So if you have a time signature of 4-4, four, four, which is, there's four beats per measure and every quarter note gets a beat, all of the notes in that measure have to add up to the equivalent of four quarter notes. There's one exception and that is what are called pickup notes, which is when you're just starting a song, you might start the song on the second or third or fourth beat, and then when you write the last measure, you have to subtract the notes that equal the value of the rest in the first measure. Remember that silence, which is called rests in music, are just as important as the notes. A lot of people have trouble because they forget to count the rests and they end up rushing their melody. So the best way to learn music theory is with a keyboard. It's easier to picture what's going on 
while looking at a piano keyboard. So if you look at the piano keyboard, you'll notice that there's arrangements of three black keys and two black keys, three black keys and two black keys, etc. The black keys are called accidentals. Now, the first thing to learn about a keyboard is where is middle C. All right, so if you see this group of three black keys and the group of two black keys, well, middle C is in the middle of the keyboard, just below the first black key. That's middle C. So now you've learned your first note. Now on the piano, there's eight notes, basically, and that is C, D, E, F, G, and then it starts over again at A, B, C. Now scales are usually major or minor, and so a major scale consists of C to D, D to E, E to F, F to G, G to A, A to B, B to C, because we're in the key of C and we're not using any accidentals. So this is a C major scale. Now, the relative minor key in the key of no sharps or flats, or the key of C, is the A minor. The key of A minor has no sharps or flats, and here's how an ascending scale sounds in a minor key. If you're going up, the note above middle C is C sharp. The note above D is D sharp. There's no black keys between the E and the F. The note above F is F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and then no black key between the B and the C. Now if you're going down, you usually uh, name the notes as a flat key. So when you're coming down, an A sharp going down would be called a B flat. They're exactly the same note. They sound exactly the same. They're just written differently. The next note below A is called an A flat. The next note below G is called a G flat. The next note be below E is called E flat. And the next note below D is called D flat. So D flat and C sharp are exactly the same note. E flat and D sharp are exactly the same note. F sharp and G flat are exactly the same note. G sharp and A flat are exactly the same note. And A sharp and B flat are exactly the same note. Those are called enharmonic notes because they are played exactly the same even though they're written differently. Scales are usually major or minor, and so a major scale consists of C to D, D to E, E to F, F to G, G to A, A to B, B to C, because we're in the key of C and we're not using any accidentals. So this is earlier I taught you about middle C and how to play up an octave till you end on the C above middle C. If you notice, the black keys are not used in that scale. But the black keys are called accidentals. So the accidentals are flats or sharps. For instance, you're playing an E and you put a flat, you use the black key below the, the E note, it changes it to an E flat. If you play the scale with an accidental on the E, it would be C, D, E flat, F, G, A, B, C. When you lower the uh, third note in the scale by a half a step, that changes the key to a minor key. Natural minor scale would be C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B, C. Music is written on a graph of five lines called a staff, S-T-A-F-F. -F. If you have more than one staff, on a piece of music that are played simultaneously, those are called staves, S-T-A-V-E-S. -E so, in the treble clef, the bottom note of the five lines is an E, and if you count up every other note, just naming only the lines on the staff, you have the notes E, G, B, D, 
B, F. And some people remember that going up as the acronym, every good boy does fine. Then the names of the spaces in between the lines, starting with the space between the first two lines on the bottom is F, and then every space above that is A, C, E. So that creates the acronym FACE. So those are the names of the notes on the treble clef. And then if you go down or below the staff, you can add ledger lines, which are space, line, space, line. And if you go above the staff, you can create ledger lines so that you can play music that's higher than the notes on the main staff. What's the difference between noise and music? Well, music is defined as organized sound. So it's sound that uh, people arrange in a way that, that makes a pleasant melody. Now music has three elements. You have melody, harmony, and rhythm. Nowadays a lot of people say that rap is music, but it doesn't have a melody. But if the song doesn't have a melody, then it's not traditionally defined music. And the optional aspects of music are that you might have lyrics, and then a new uh, feature that people consider important is called sound textures, which is created by using different sounds on different instruments. So on a synthesizer, you might have different sounds. For instance, you might have a keyboard sound like a piano. You can have a harpsichord. Or maybe a vibraphone. Or you might have an organ sound. That music I played was called a Dresden Amen, which is used commonly in final notes of church music. All right, so with the melody, you can change the pitch by shortening the distance on the string or playing a note that's higher on the keyboard. For instance, let me demonstrate on the guitar. All right, so the low note on a guitar is an E, the E string. If you put your finger on the first fret, which is that little bar across the fingerboard, or the fretboard, you raise the note because you've shortened the distance of the string. And if you keep going up by each fret is a half tone, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A. So you're playing way high on the fingerboard, and in this position, on the 12th fret, I believe it is, you've raised the notes by an octave by shortening the string into two parts by half. Now, the more pressure you use, whether you're blowing, plucking, or banging, the louder the music is going to be, or the higher the frequencies are gonna be. Here's a melody based on a scale. Scales go up or down by the order of the next note in the sequence. So if I'm playing a melody starting off with middle C, here's a melody using scales. Melodies use either scales or arpeggios, which are the same as chords, except one note is played at a time. So here's an example of a melody using arpeggios, or chords, one note at a time. So you see it's playing every other note going up or down, instead of every note going up or down. Figure 311B, arpeggios melody. Here's a graphic on figure 311C using scales and arpeggios mixed together. Here's another example of a mixed melody using scales and arpeggios and different rhythms. Figure 311D.
Uh, figure 311D is a mixed melody using different rhythms and scales and arpeggios. So, melodies go up or down by scales or, or arpeggios, which are the same as chords, one note at a time, with intervals. Now we're going to talk about harmony. The common form of harmony is called a triad, which is three notes separated by a note. So in my example, I start with a note, middle C, skip the next note and play the third note, which is an E, and skip the next note and play the fifth note, which is G. That makes up a major chord. So the intervals are the first note goes up a major third and then goes up to the fifth note which is a minor third. So on your staff starting with middle C and you skip the next D and you play the E and you skip the F and play the G. So that's a triad. If you play them all together, it's a C major chord. And basically, major chords are used in happy songs, peppy songs, cheerful songs. If you have a minor chord, which is the next common chord, uh, you start with a note and go up a minor third, and then to the fifth is a major third from the third. Starting with the note A, Go up a minor third, so you skip the B and then play a C natural. And you skip the fourth note, which is a D, and you play the fifth note, which is an E, which is a major third above the C. That gives you that minor sound. Now minor chords, starting with the A below middle C, here's the root, which is an A, and uh, skip the B and play a C, and skip the D and play an E, hear that sound? That's a minor chord. In a key signature, if you're playing in the key of C, for example, the C is the main chord, and the A minor is the relative minor chord. So stems. If you have a triad and most of the notes are above B, the stems go down on the left side. If you have a chord and most of the notes are below C, uh, the stems are on the right side and go up. If we play the triads based on the notes in the major scale, starting in the key of C with the middle C, and if we keep going up the scale, the second note, and you play starting on the note D, and uh, no accidentals, the notes are D, F, A, so that would be a minor chord. And then if you start a triad on the next note, E, and play every other note, you have another minor chord, which is E minor. And then the next note in the C major scale is F, and if you play every other note, you get F, A, C, which is a major chord. And then, starting on the note G, every other note would be G, B, D, which is a major chord, and usually on that chord, you add a slatted seventh, so that would be G, B, D, F natural. It's called a five seven chord. The next note above that would be an A, which is the relative minor chord. A, C, E would be a minor chord. The next note above that is B, and every other note would be B, D, F, which is a diminished chord. Now diminished chords are funny because uh, you play every other note up a minor third from the previous note. So if you start with the letter B and play a B diminished, it would be B, D, F, A flat. And you hear that distinctive sound? That's a diminished chord. So if I play a scale based on every other note in the key of C, starting with the middle C, and using triads, it would sound like this. Now usually uh, you, your harmonies don't follow that progression. C major triad.
if you play a triad on each note of the scale, here's what you get. You get a C, a D minor, because we're only using the white keys in the key of C, an E minor, an F, a G, an A minor, a B diminished, and then we end up on the C chord again. The progression is never used in most real music, but I'll play those again. You get a major chord, minor chord, minor, major, major, minor, diminished, major chord. Now, these are commonly referred to by the Roman numerals. This is, the C is a, C major is a one chord. D minor is a two minor chord. The E minor is a three minor chord. The four chord is the F, or the four chord, it's a major chord. The G is a major chord. And the G usually has a flatted seventh note attached to it. Then the A is a minor chord, it's the sixth chord. And the B is B diminished, the seventh chord is a B diminished. And the C ends up on a major chord. Now the difference between a major chord is that in a major chord, the interval between the first note, the root, and the third note is a major third and the interval between the third note, which is an E, and the fifth note, which is a G, is a minor third. So the first interval is a major third, the second interval is a minor third. Now, to play a minor C chord, you lower the third one half step, so the first interval is a minor third instead of a major chord, and the second interval is E flat to G, which is a major third. So here's your minor chord. So if you were to play an A minor using the scale all the way up the scale, you would play A, C, E, which is a minor chord. B diminished. C major. D minor. E minor. F. G. A minor. Now inversions are, for example, you take a C chord, C, E, G. So the first inversion is a starts with the note on the bottom of an E, and then G and C. And the second inversion is G, which is the fifth note of the chord usually, and G C E. So here's the inversions: uh, root position, E on the bottom. And the advantage of that is. If you're uh, changing chords, you don't have to move your fingers very far. So like if you're playing in a progression from C to F, you can play the F. And that's using the third inversion on the F chord. C, F, and then G. You just go up one, or, uh, one whole tone. And then end up on the C. So you can see how using inversions keeps you from having to move your fingers all over. Makes your accuracy better. So key signatures. Key signatures are a way of telling you what key the song is in. These are the key signatures. In the sharp keys, start with C, and then the one sharp is the key of G, two sharps is the key of D, Three sharps is the key of A. Four sharps is the key of E. Five sharps is the key of B. Six sharps is the key of F sharp. Seven sharps is the key of C sharp. And that's where you have that raised E that I talked about earlier that was seldom used. It's called an E sharp instead of an F. Now the flat keys the key signatures are starting with C, or C chord, and then one flat is the key of F, two flats is the key of B flat, 
three flats is the key of E flat, four flats is the key of A flat, five flats is the key of D flat, which is the same notes as the key of C sharp, six flats is the key of G flat, and seven flats, which is hardly ever used, is the key of C. Now learn to understand what the relative minor keys are because you'll be playing those in chord progressions often. So in the key of C, the relative minor is A minor. That's just a common pattern. One chord, minor six chord, four chord, and five seven chord. And that's a common chord pattern. So learn the C triad, and then you can learn each key by transposing up or down a half a step and learn all the triads and whether they're major or minor in those other keys too. First here's the type of common chords you'll run into. The major chord which is C, E, G and then the four chord which is F, A, C and then the five chord which is G, B, D and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. You also have diminished chords which are starting with the root C, go up a minor third for four notes. It's, so it's not technically a triad. The other uh, type of common chord is a minor chord, which is where you lower the third to a minor third interval and a major third interval up to the fifth note, which is a G. So C, E flat, G is a minor chord. So here's a major chord, C major, C minor, and the four chord and the five chord and that's a common chord progression another uh, technique to learn is called the circle of fourths which i call it it's typically called the circle of fifths but it's the same thing a circle of fourths is where you start on a chord and you go up and play the chords every fourth note above that so if you're playing a c chord and you would play an F major chord. Then the next note above the circle of fourths would be a fourth note above F, which is B flat. And a fourth note above that is E flat chord. And A flat. And D flat. And G flat. That's called the circle of fourths. And it's common in, it's a common chord progression in music. And what I recommend that you do is the way I learned how to play chords is I happened to be sick once for a couple of weeks and when I was home I had a chord wheel and a guitar uh, book with dots showing where your fingers go. And I learned that when I, a song was playing on the radio, I would move my fingers up and down on the bass strings of the guitar and until I found out what the main note was in the song and then I figured that was the key of the song and then I would uh, use the chord wheel and find the, the key and then the chord wheel would tell me what the relative minor chords were and what the fourth and the fifth chords were. All right, I'm gonna give you an example of uh, common chord patterns. One chord, four chord, five seven chord, and the one chord. So like, I wrote this song called Night School. Baby, you can miss and I'll teach you what you need to know. Anything you like, I can show you how. Just come over to my class and I'll teach you right now. Give me a 
Now I'll play a different sample of a country chord progression, which is uh, one, four, five, one. And uh, in this song, I'm gonna add a flatted seventh to each chord just to give it that bluesy, country funky sound. She wore a one on her ankle and a flower in her hair. A satin gown with diamonds said, come catch me if you dare. Four chord. For the devil to find to hold and capture you one. And then the chorus starts on the fourth chord. It was satin silk and skin like milk and a one walked to stop the crowd. chord pattern using the one minor six four and five chord pattern in the one the minor six in the two minor four five awaken one six minor higher two five four you are not alone four minor if you want six minor two can one, six minor, two minor, five, seven, you can one, and the six minor, the two minor, your four chord, four minor chord, no one, six minor, two minor, five, seven, So it'll be four, two, minor, three, minor, every one, and a two minor, and a five, seven, and a one. He's your four, two minor, he's your three minor, six minor, just two minor, and C, five, seven, one. So here's a version of you'll be sorry using simple chords and then I'll play another version using more complicated chords and you can see what chords I'm using by following along with the graph you'll be sorry you'll remember the times that you cheated you'll be sorry
verse using simple chords of the song, You'll Be Sorry. Now, to make it a little more interesting, I added some complicated chords, including a C-sharp diminished chord, a five minor chord instead of a, the one chord. So here it is with complicated chords. At least here's one verse with the introduction. only using one chord, like if you remember Sharon and Sonny, Sonny and Cher, the chords that they use on The Beat Goes On was just one chord throughout the whole song. The song A Horse With No Name just uses two chords throughout the whole song. The song Jambalaya by Hank Williams just uses the one and the five chord all the way through the whole song. You can write songs with as simple chords as you like or the most complicated songs if you care to. And it's just a matter of taste whether you like the song that's the more complicated version or the least complicated version. If you want to learn more about the sounds that the different instruments make in an orchestra or band, you can get the book that I mentioned earlier called The Study of Orchestration by Samuel Adler. Okay, I just want to have a, one more thing that I want to talk to you about, and that is, that is song structure, which we discussed briefly earlier. The song St. Louis Blues is in the public domain because it's been more than 70 years since the author William C. Handy died. So I'm going to use that song as an example of song structure. And uh, we'll play a little bit of it first. I need to see. second verse goes in the minor key. St. Louis woman with all her diamond ring. So I was playing the key of C major to start with and then I switched to C minor in the second verse. And then it goes back to C major later on. One of the earliest memories I have is of my father writing sheet music in the garage where we were living with 
in the back of my uncle's house in Los Angeles, and his goal was to be a songwriter. He didn't know how to write music, so he had a friend, and they were writing the sheet music out with pencil, and I still have that sheet music. So that's an image that stuck with me all my life, and uh, I suppose I'm trying to fulfill his dream by being a songwriter. He gave up early when he was gonged off the gong show on television in Los Angeles. But my uh, philosophy is to be persistent and don't quit, keep trying. Okay, I'm just gonna repeat this. If you don't know how to write music, find a friend who does know how to write music, or your other option is to learn how to write music yourself. It's not that hard. It's probably easier than learning a whole new language, and uh, it doesn't take that much time, so why not just put out the effort? Okay, thanks for coming this week, and I'll see you at the next episode. Bye-bye.